much. My name is Don Murray, and I am part of the curriculum committee for the St. John Valley Senior College. And we'd like to welcome everybody here, including Paul tonight. Um, and a little background on Paul. He gave me a little piece that I could use, said take whatever you'd like out of it. I think I took it all. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's what most of it is. <laughs> um, Paul has always maintained an acute interest in cross-cultural communications. He is proficient in English. French, as you just heard, mm -hmm. Spanish, German, Ooh. Russian, and I hope it's Waldorf. 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 Waldorf over the course of four academic years in French Canada, Quebec City, Russia, Vororozhev, Varunish, Varunish. <laughs> you can see I don't speak Russian. <laughs> 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 and Dakar, and Senegal. Wow. Two of these experiences were through the auspices of the Fulbright program. He still enjoys traveling internationally. He moved into Maine, to Maine, in 2001 to begin his doctorate in U.S. and Canadian history <coughs> at the University of Maine, which he completed in 2008. Paul is one of only two people to have completed his history dissertation at Orono in the French language. Thereafter, he moved to the St. John Valley to teach French at Wisdom High School. Um, in St. Agathe, the town that he proudly calls home today. After one year at Wisdom, he undertook his present position at the University of Maine at Fort Kent, where he serves as the Associate Professor of History and Education. He also has taught a number of elementary French and Spanish courses at UMFK. Paul enjoys participating in his adopted community particularly in local organizations that promote and celebrate the French language and the Acadian and Franco-American culture of the St. John Valley. Paul was born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland, and is a fourth generation Annapolitan. Um, and as Annapolis had only one public high school, Paul had to enjoy, had the joy of developing friendships across many different cultural, linguistic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Paul has taken these early, vastly positive lessons and has applied them to the best of his ability to his life in Eastern Maine and in the St. John Valley. The St. John Valley Senior College welcomes him tonight as he pre presents the Webster Ashburton Treaty of 1842 and Maine's Northern Border. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. I'm very happy to be here for for Thank you for coming to listen to the presentation. Um, today I will talk about yes, Webster Ashburton and the Northern Border, but I'm also going to set up a bit of context too so that we can, um, maybe some folks in the room, and quite frankly, many of you in the room may know more about this than I do, but my area comes in to present kind of the context and also to give you the history, the historiographical, the professional history writing background on this. So I've often said that when I teach, it is impossible to know all content. It is impossible, we can't. So I fully realize that many of you that are born and raised here May have, may have stories about the border and about Webster Ashburton and this kind of thing, and I would love to hear some of those as we go forward. So I would never use the term expert for myself. No. As a professional historian, you learn to shy away from that word. <laughs> so my point being, again, some of you in this room, I'm sure, are a compendium of, uh, are a compendium of knowledge. Um, Don, that's on the camera, I know certainly, knows a great deal about this valley, and so many others in this room. So many 
familiar faces that I see here today. So again, uh, keep that in mind as I present. If you have something to add, please do. I've done this presentation as well um, for the Maine Humanities Council. That's where this developed from. And that was uh, in uh, collaboration with the Maine Bicentennial Commemoration, which of course would have been 2020. As we know, in this area, or as if we don't know, uh, we'll learn it hopefully today, in this area, there was a dispute with the border until 1842. So what happened downstate as far as this main bicentennial commemoration is concerned is very different than perhaps what we had up here. So I tend to think that the term almost from Mars Hill South, we would say it was a main bicentennial celebration because that part of, uh, of the area was, or that part of the state was definitively part of Maine. Whereas here, this was still in dispute for another 22 years. So as a historian, can we really say that it was truly the bicentennial in this part of the state? So that's kind of the genesis for this presentation. So I've done this presentation in Lille at uh, the Musée Etudiaire du Montparnasse, Don Sear, my friend and colleague that, that runs uh, that uh, fine institution. And I've also done it in a couple of libraries downstate. So I've, I've taken this uh, presentation a bit on the road, again, through the auspices of the Maine Humanities Council. So, but today, this is for the senior college, for all of you. And I'm looking forward to uh, presenting. So let's get going. And the first thing is, instead of putting up the first slide, I'll ask you, what would you like to know today about Webster Ashford and Treaty? What I will do is I'll try to tailor the presentation to what you'd like to know. And what do you know already about it? Anyone? Just some word association. Yes. I don't know anything about it. Nothing about it. OK, no problem. That's what we're here for. Anyone else? I'd like to know what's not in the history books. Uh, wait a minute, and there we go. And we'll do our best to at least include maybe some things that are not in the professional history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And let me get everyone's name too. A lot of folks, like I say, I know here, but let's just go around quickly. If, uh, John Peters. John, nice to meet you. May. May. And Larry. Larry. Yeah. 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 Paul. Paul. Oh, ah, Paul. Nice to meet you, Paul. Paul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I like you already. Yeah, I like you too. Thank you. Daryl Peters. Uh, Daryl Peters, yes. Bill, Bill Loader. Bill, yeah. Karen Willett. Linda Bishaw. Linda. Bill Bishaw. Add down. Helen Ghetto. And Don Murray. Awesome. Thank you. So, so what would you like to know, and what do you already know about Webster Ashford? And for those who are into, who are educators here, I'm just doing kind of a live version of a KWL chart, basically, right now. <laughs> know what to know, and what did you learn? So. I, I'd, I'd like to know some of the, uh, I'm sure there were some interesting stories about the, about the negotiations, on how they arrived at the border, and uh, where, where it would be. Absolutely. You know, did you hear some of those? Yeah, we'll talk about that for sure. Anything else? Okay, so I have an idea of where I'll kind of orient this, and I always teach without notes on purpose because I wanted to be a little bit more spontaneous. So. The first thing I want to do is go through a few different terms, a few different terms here, and I'll explain this. So when we're talking about history, we tend to look at it in two ways. We tend to look at what's called diachronic history and synchronic history. Now, diachronic history, dia is from the Greek, which means through. It's from the Greek for through. Chronos. I don't really write uh, in the Greek alphabet, although I can kind of read it, but, so I'll use uh, Latin letters at least. Chronos means time. So we want to look at what happens, yes, with Webster Ashburton in 1842, but we also want to go through time from basically the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which kind of set up the conditions for the dispute on the border, the famous heights of land in the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which we'll get to, up to 1842. So diachronic history, folks. Diachronic means change through time. So that's what we're going to look at. Basically, roughly six decades of change through time from the Treaty of Paris that ended officially the US Revolution and the moment at which Great Britain officially recognized the United States, 1783. Um, and we'll get to the, I'll mention the Treaty of Paris here in a bit, up to 1842. 
until the webster ashburton Treaty was concluded and eventually ratified by both London and Washington. So diachronic history through time. Synchronic history, they function together. Synchronic history, if you would like, you can think of diachronic history as almost like a line through time. Whereas synchronic history you can think of as a set of dots, almost like snapshots. Synchronic comes from the term syn or syn from uh, the Greek uh, with, and then chronos again, time. So, synchronic history, think of as a set of snapshots, uh, snappy shots. An example of that, folks, would be the Webster Ashburton Treaty in 1842. That in and of itself is a piece of synchronic history. That is a, almost like if you want to think of it in terms of the hard sciences, maybe in terms of biology, like a cross section, like of a slot, a cross section. So this is almost like a cross section, or if you prefer, a snapshot, a moment in history. So basically what I'm going to be doing today is trying to weave the two together. Basically, that line all the way from the Treaty of Paris in 1783 up until Webster Ashburton in 1842, but also take various moments within that 60 year span, basically. So synchronic history. And the conjuncture is just basically the lining up of those two. I mean, there's more to it than that. And then teleology is basically the idea of purpose behind history. The Greek teleos for purpose. So, like we said, and I forgot your name again. Karen. Karen. Like you we were talking about before, what is not in the history books? What is or is not? We as humans, we all have biases because we're human, right? So the question is, the question is, how do we negotiate our biases, whatever they may be, when we're writing history? It's a professional historian or it's an amateur historian. So that's what teleology is. It's the idea of what is the purpose behind the history. And I'll, I'll just take this, and I'm actually going to use this as a jumping off point, something that I tend to share with my US history classes. Um, and I teach mostly general education courses by choice here, because I love to do the rudiments or the basic uh, idea of historical thought. I love building up from the bottom. So basically, this is, uh, this is kind of a, an important distinction for us. So history is written by humans, and is a it is a um, documented story about the past, a nonfiction story about the past. It has been researched, hopefully, very well. Whereas the past is the past. It doesn't change. History, however, the way it's written, teleology, the purpose behind writing history, that can change. So that is a very important distinction for us today, that we're simply trying to reconstruct um, a story. We're trying to build a story about the past. The past itself doesn't change, but the story we tell can, and it does. Depends on so many different factors. And then multiculturalism in our situation here, obviously, multiculturalism refers to that is a form of multiculturalism. Uh, obviously, in the U.S., the dominant language is English, as we know. But this area was French-speaking before that border was drawn. So this is a form, as far as I'm concerned, of multiculturalism that is often overlooked. That is very important. The French language in this area, in my understanding, and in, and in literally anything that I've studied or anyone that I've talked to, the French language here, again, existed on this territory, literally, 1785, uh, early settlers, right? And of course, there were folks who were coming through, um, trading furs and all kinds of things and using this area as a portage before that. But permanent settlement, 1780s, that border was drawn in 1842. That is very different, folks, than even places like Old Town, which is probably the nearest French-speaking area, tr uh, traditionally French-speaking area, at least, in the 1800s and 1900s in Maine, and a lot of folks in Old Town actually can trace their ancestry up here from the 1830s, first big out migration. Old Town South, it tends to be more of an immigrant mentality when it comes to the French language. So folks that have moved from Quebec or from Acadia into those areas, whereas here, the language was here, and then the border was drawn. That is a huge difference. So that will actually play into what we talk about when we look at uh, Webster Ashburton moving forward. Okay, so of course we can see that this is 
some Africa New England. But I want to do some perspective. And I always like to talk about perspective when we're doing geography or history or whatever the case may be. So this, obviously, is where we are today in northernmost New England. But what is important, I think, for us to understand, too, is that um, so many folks, and as we know, south of Holton, tend to think of where we are as kind of, quote, the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. And is that a perspective? Yes, it is a, a perspective. But when we think in terms, again, multiculturalism, French language, and I'll, have a, I'll show a slide later about this. This area, whether we're on the main side of the river or whether we just literally, although it's hard with COVID, but if we walk to Claire, we could even walk to Claire as we know, whether it's here or across the river, this area is in the middle of the action of the French language in this part of North America. It is not on the edge, it is right in the middle. That is very important. And I can't stress it enough. So again, this whole idea about perspective is incredibly, incredibly uh, important. And also the whole idea of multiculturalism too. Because at this point, um, the French language is um, still very much alive in our area. Sadly, as we know, it is uh, being lost over the years, but it is still very much alive and has been for two and a quarter centuries on this territory. So of course, that is a uh, political map of the state of Maine, again, political in the sense of uh, just the uh, geopolitical boundaries, of course, Aroostook County being the largest county, just to re recall, the largest county east in any uh, state fully east of the Mississippi River because of uh, St. Louis County, Missouri, uh, Missouri. <laughs> St. Louis, yes, St. Louis, Missouri. And there was a St. Louis County, but St. Louis County, Min Minnesota is what I was getting at. St. Louis County, Minnesota, which is in the northeastern part of Minnesota, is actually slightly larger in area than Aroostook County, but as we know, the state of Minnesota is not fully east of the Mississippi River, so that's where the, the play on words kind of <laughs> comes in. So Aroostook County is indeed the largest county in area in any state fully east of the Mississippi River. So again, we're talking about a huge um, swath of land, as we know. OK, so I say main statehood. I'm actually going to go back to the Treaty of Paris. And I'll do that. Uh, here's kind of an overview for you. But I'm going to take us through the Treaty of Paris, um, 1783, which basically ended the US Revolution. Okay. So as we know, the US Revolution was fought from 1775 to 1783. Depends on your definition, because some folks would say that the Boston Massacre of 1770 was really the veritable start of the U.S. Revolution. Um, you can make that argument, but I'll use 1775. I'll use the more traditional um, definition here. So 1783, of course, Treaty of Paris occurs, um, which ends the American Revolution. But this area of Maine was in dispute. Why? Because in the Treaty of Paris, there was this idea of the heights of land. The heights of land that would determine the border between Maine, well, Maine, of course, at that time, the District of Massachusetts, and British North America. It would be determined by the heights of land. So in the British definition, basically those heights of land, it basically separates uh, waters that flow into the St. Lawrence River from those that flow into the Atlantic Ocean. Those heights of land for the British, basically, were at Mars Hill, roughly, westward. And the reason why is because they saw the British being, uh, being the British, they saw the St. John River as not flowing into the Atlantic Ocean, but into the Bay of Fundy, which is not of the Atlantic, but it, it's, again, play on words, but it was to their advantage in the, in the British sense. So basically, the St. John River flows into in the, British, in, in the British understanding of it, into the Bay of Fundy, not into the Atlantic Ocean, which would therefore make the heights of land at Mars Hill. In the American definition, it would be, in fact, all the way almost up to 15 miles from where the Guyage Louis in, in Quebec, that close to the river, even less than 15 miles. So we're going to see that as we go forward. But keep that in mind, please. So the Treaty of Paris, 1783, I'll write that on the board. Treaty of Paris. There were several treaties of Paris. This one is 1783. And 
we want to consider the heights of land. It's those heights of land, separate waters flowing into the St. Lawrence from those that flow into the Atlantic. So basically the heights of land. Yeah. That's kind of what sets up our land dispute up this way. Determining what's flowing into the Atlantic and what's flowing into the St. Lawrence. Okay. So that is key for us. Now, some other pieces of the puzzle that I want to give as well are about the state of Maine. Um, it's, it's a ventral statehood in 1820, but again, remember that Maine at this time is a district of Massachusetts, as we know. Um, so bringing Maine into the US would in fact be um, a very complex situation. And most of the folks that were kind of driving uh, the idea of bringing Maine into the United States were largely those excuse me, folks who were downstate who were in favor of um, building Maine in a separate way from Massachusetts, getting as much uh, lumbering and as much uh, lumber capital to stay in the state of Maine as opposed to going into the markets in Boston and further south. So it was a, it was a localizing of the economy. That was the idea. So it's important just to know that a lot of folks who were in, in Maine, in the district of Maine, wanted to bring Maine to statehood. But again, that could not happen given the uh, importance of uh, the institution of slavery in the US and sectional, what we call sectional balance. Sectional balance. And I'll have a map on this later. Sectional balance between the North and the South as far as Senate seats are concerned. We had to, at least in terms of uh, Washington anyway, when I say we, I'm talking about uh, official Washington and those who wanted to maintain sectional balance between the North and the South. So this would play into bringing Maine into the Union. Maine would come into uh, the Union in 1820, Missouri or Missouri, pronounce it as you would, 1821 as a slave state, Maine of course is a free state in 1820. And the way to do that, the reason why Maine was allowed in and then Missouri was allowed in the year later as a slave state was to keep uh, that sectional balance between North and South as far as the number of Senate seats that were in the hands of slave states versus free states. So we'll take a look at that in just a moment. And again, the last bullet point here, Upper St. John Valley up to the Treaty of Washington, that's the official name for the webster ashburton Treaty, Treaty of Washington, 1842 several treaties of Washington as well. We are in, obviously, at that point, disputed territory. So, it's a little bit of a US history lesson to kind of get us to the heart of the matter, which is Webster Ashburton. So, uh, this right here is a map of the early US, around the time of 1821. So, again, we'll count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 free states. And you'll have that many slave states down here as well. Starting with Maryland and Delaware. A lot of folks um, forget that, that, actually think that the Mason-Dixon line is north of Delaware. Actually, it goes between Maryland and Delaware. But still, even though Delaware is technically north of the Mason-Dixon line, it was a slave state at that point. So we have, at this point, 12 slave states and 12 free states. So this is very important. That's part of the reason why it took decades, in many ways, to get Maine into the Union because of the question of slavery and of enslaved people, basically. So the compromise was this, so that we know. 36 degrees, 30 minutes, right here. And I don't know enough about the story of the Missouri boot heel, but everything except for the Missouri boot heel, basically, is, in the state of Missouri, is above 36 degrees and 30 minutes. Bless you. And so, basically, here, this unorganized territory, which is drawn out of the Louisiana Purchase of 1804, this, per the Missouri Compromise, would be settled as free territory. But the compromise was this. Anything about 36 degrees, 30 minutes. But in the case of Missouri here, this would be, would be uh, admitted to the United States, but as a slave state, even though it's north of 3630, in order to keep that sectional balance. So that's very, very important for us here. The one error on the map 
Although I like this map book because it is, it, it does a great job at explaining things. The one error on the map is our error. It's still in dispute at this point. So this is not the hard border of Maine as it is today, post-1842. So even, my point is, I chose this map because even with professional historians sometimes, we forget, we as professional historians forget that when we put up a map of 1821, that we need to have maybe a hatch area or something like this to show that this is in dispute. But yes, Maine would in fact have that border, but it doesn't at this time. So, um, moving forward then, let's take a look at the next slide. So now we get into maps, and I love maps. I love using them to teach history. And thank goodness, right here in the state of Maine, we have a wonderful map library, the Osher Map Library at USM in Portland. And my friend and colleague, uh, Libby Bischoff, heads that, um, that institution right now. And I've been down to the Ocean Map Library and looked at some of these maps that are wonderful. And when you have a chance, if you're in Portland, if you're in Southern Maine, I definitely would suggest that you go to the Ocean Map Library, if you're able, and get some of these. Um, you can ask whoever is on duty to get the maps for you, and they'll lay them out on the table. The Moses Greenleaf map literally stretches probably about from here probably about here and to about this table here. So it's a huge, and when you see it in front of you, there's nothing like having that history, literally 200 years, since it's from 1820, a 200-year-old map sitting in front of you with the liveliest colors you can imagine, and you can read all of the details on the map. Seeing it on the screen just doesn't do it justice. But we are going to use this to um, understand the whole situation leading up to West Strasburg. So, and to understand Moses Greenleaf, who was, a, uh, who was a lawyer in the southern part of Maine, to understand his mentality, because he was in favor of the more, um, uh, the, the friendlier definition in the, in the sense of the state of Maine, the friendlier definition of what the heights of land were, in other words, getting them up close to the St. Lawrence River. So this is Moses Greenleaf's perception of what the borders of Maine should be all the way basically up to those heights of land. Now keep in mind that we basically are about right here on that map. Roughly about right there. So this is the whole valley. So it is fascinating when we think about Moses Greenleaf's perception that all of this should be indeed part of the state of Maine. And there's actually a notation here and it talks about a couple of hundred French families, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says a couple of hundred French families on the map. It's written here, you can't see it, but he makes a note that there are French language families in this area. Okay, so that's important as well. Now, I can't stress enough with Moses Greenleaf <coughs> that even though he says that this should all be part of the state of Maine, and he does in fact mention the population in this area, not even we haven't even really started to mention native peoples or First Nations, as folks would be called across the river, that are of indigenous uh, uh, descent. He does mention that in a couple of spots on the map as well. Folks who are of native descent, as well as these several hundred French families that are located here. So he mentions that. Now we want to keep that in mind. And I'm not by any stretch, let me just make it very clear, that it is it is a cardinal sin of a historian. It is something a historian should not do. And that is to judge the past using present standards. We can't do that. So I've got to be careful here. Having said that, I will say that Moses Greenleaf, he does say that there, is, there are inhabitants here, native folks, as well as French-speaking folks, on, on some of the areas of this map. However, notice the next map I'm going to show you. It is also by Moses Greenleaf, and the title of the map. It's longer, so I'll just, eight years later, while the dispute's going on here. 1828 map of the inhabited part of the state of Maine. Is it exhibiting any progress of its settlement since, since, uh, since the 1778, that was what was written. Um, the representative districts, 1820, etc. since 1820, so obviously since state, eight years. 
draw our attention to this adjective, or it's really technically, I mean, it's drawn from a past participle to my language hat here, but this adjective right here, inhabited part of me. Guess what part of the state he shows? Oh my goodness. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, again, I'm being careful because I will not throw <coughs> Moses Greenleaf under the bus. I won't do that because we don't want to do that. As a historian, we don't. But we do have to kind of highlight the, I'll just say the contrast or the inconsistencies perhaps in uh, his wording of this inhabited part of me, yet in order to make the point about northern Maine being uh, part of, part of Maine, what would become part of Maine, he does show the French families that are there and also some native families. So again, the inhabited part. So this area isn't inhabited? Well, it is. You just said it was eight years ago, but that's okay. So we can see here this difference. And again, like I said, I'm really trying not to um, um, throw any kind of, um, throw any kind of negativity toward, toward Greenleaf. That's not my intent. It's just to show that there is, there is a lot of gray here, just basically what he's saying versus what he, um, what the diachronic piece of this tells us over that eight years, basically. Okay, so, um, next map. And the rest of the presentation is gonna be basically built on maps, and I'm gonna take us up to uh, 1842. So another thing that's important for us to remember, folks, is that after the U.S. Revolution, um, we need to find also the sources of the Connecticut River for the purposes of the New Hampshire part of the, uh, the border between New Hampshire and what would be Quebec, or at that time, Lower Canada, basically. So the whole idea that the Connecticut River, we have to find the sources of it. Uh, there's a map, and this ties into Webster Ash River too, and that's a part of it that we often forget. 1836, uh, this map, and you can see, and it's just to show that it's important to find that source of the northernmost source of the Connecticut River because that would in fact play into Webster Ashburton as well. So it's not just about the state of Maine. There are other parts of Webster Ashburton, actually that I'm going to touch on today too, um, that it wasn't just about the Maine border. It was also about uh, the U.S. and people forget this, and actually Don Sear and I have talked about it on more than one occasion, um, both publicly and also just in our, in our chat sometimes, about how Webster Ashburton is not only about the border dispute, but it's also about um, US, the US, so Washington and London basically teaming together to crack down on the illicit trading of enslaved peoples. Interestingly, that's, that's uh, Article 8, by the way, of uh, Webster Ashburton. But uh, I'll come back to that if we have time. But it's important. So let's come back to the Connecticut River. That is also part of Webster Ashburton. So it doesn't just affect the state of Maine, is my point. It's actually a treaty that has um, a wide ranging uh, effect, basically. So this would be basically northern New Hampshire and what, be, what would be on the border of what is now the eastern townships of Quebec are called Les Tris in French or uh, Les Cantons de l'Est, either one. You'll hear both terms used. In French for the Eastern Townships. So again, uh, so some more maps. Map of this disputed territory. And again, it just goes to show, just like we saw with Moses Greenleaf, this is the point of these maps. It shows the human perspective and the fact that we do indeed have a certain level of bias, just because we're, we're human, it's going to happen. A certain level of bias when we look at our history. And Moses Greenleaf showed some of his, and not to not to poke fun, it's just you know he has one map where you, know, you have uh, this area up here that has uh, inhabitants, and then he talks about the inhabited part of Maine is further south. So this map as well from 1839. So this would be three years before the Webster Ashburton Treaty, and this this map would show up in the Boston Times, which would be a newspaper with a fair amount of circulation at that point. So the point is this, that in Massachusetts as well, was the Maine border dispute more driven by the state of Maine and by state officials than others? Yes. But by the time we get to 1839, um, just after the bloodless Aroostook War, which I wish I had more time to cover, but I want to try to get through all of these here. Basically, 1839, they're hearing about this in Boston. 
to the point where Boston newspapers are publishing lithographs of maps here. So again, this is, um, this is what would have shown up in the Boston Times at that time. And again, they tend to show, yes, they show the British, um, the British line. Again, it's largely Mars Hill westward. Not exactly, but, but roughly Mars Hill westward. And then the US map that goes all the way up, like I said, within 12, 10 to 12 miles of Rivière du Loup and up uh, all the way to the headwaters of La Timisquatari, you know, a lake kind of squat that would feed eventually into the Madawaska River and down into the St. John, etc. And this one, now this one is, oh, I'm sorry, this one is basically from the family magazine, J. J.S. Redford, and again, this is 1839 too, and my point in showing all of these is that basically in the last three years before the border would get drawn, there was a great deal of media attention paid in the United States to this border dispute. Whereas before, it was largely seen as something that was largely driven by the state of Maine and by officials uh, in Augusta trying to get control for the purposes, obviously, of, of, of economic benefit with, with lumber, right? So one question, too, that I wanted to get at before um, I show this map, too, is the whole idea of the king of the Netherlands. King of the Netherlands. King William of the Netherlands. There was an attempt in the intervening time between 1783, then you had the Treaty of Ghent, actually in 1814, which would set up the, um, which would kind of set up the criteria for defining the border. The Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812, and then finally 1842, uh, which would be Webster Ashford and the Treaty of Washington. So in that time period, between 1814 in 1842, in the 1820s, the king of the Netherlands was called upon to basically come up with a solution as a neutral party, as a neutral third party, to come up with a solution about the border between London and Washington. Of course, British North America and the United States of America. So, that border that the king of the Netherlands came up with, that King William came up with, was very close to what the Webster-Ashburton border would be in 1842. But the problem was that many in the state of Maine, in the legislature especially, were not satisfied with the, with the dispute. Many in Washington, many uh, officials in Washington were ready to accept it, as in London. But it was actually um, several officials in the state of Maine, right here in the state of Maine, in Augusta, that said, no, we want to have that border all the way up close to the St. Lawrence River. So, in fact, part of the reason why the dispute continued was because of the interest of those in the Maine State Legislature who wanted to push for more territory. So, this could have actually been resolved as many as uh, 15, almost 20 years before Webster Ashford. Okay, and then again, like I said, the border ended up being pretty close to, um, with pretty close to, in 1842, what King uh, William of the Netherlands had, had, uh, had suggested as a mutual third party. So this one is the family magazine again. And a similar map. And then here, and then here you can see um, this area. And this area right here is considered to be area that has already population. That's the reason why there's this box here. Um, and then on this map, the reason why I mentioned the King of the Netherlands here is because on this map, it is explicitly stated, and it's hard to see it, but I'll read it for you. It says, line proposed by King of the Netherlands along the St. John River. So again, that is so fascinating, and it isn't always pointed out. It isn't always pointed out. Right, uh, right uh, in all of these maps, but this one has it written explicitly, line proposed by the King of the Netherlands. And then a few, there were some square miles of, um, of difference in what the King of the Netherlands had proposed on the northwestern border of Maine, but it was, very, it was still very close though to what, um, what would end up being accepted by both London and Washington in 1842. 
So um, this is a good place for us to kind of see, again, the St. John River flowing into the Bay of Fundy for the British, into the Atlantic Ocean for, for the United States. Again, it's that, that difference in where those waters flow that would determine the whole height of land piece. And again, the St. Lawrence River here, and then that city is about right there, where Bangor's here, and we're roughly uh, right here in this area, right along. Um, the I have a question. Yes, of course. Yeah, um, please do. Yeah. The heights of land, mm -hmm. whether they flowed into St. Lawrence or into the ocean, did they have a different monetary value? A different monetary value? Like, like was, was one parcel of land deemed more beneficial, more, more uh, productive, more, more income producing? Um, the one thing that most people were interested in at this point, of course, was lumbering. So if there was, there were, if there were more, uh, if there was more timber available, then of course, um, that would be the case, but it was more, of course, in the state of Maine. It was driven less by farming than it was by lumber. The folks in Bangor and other places like that who wanted it for lumber. And of course, you know, John Baker would come north too. I didn't even mention John Baker, but a lot of folks know the, the, the name. Of course, he's very important in local board. So, so there's not necessarily any, any particular value other than the whole lumber, lumbering piece. That's the biggest piece of it. And, oh yes, and another thing I'd point out too, um, and I think it'll kind of uh, touch on your question a bit too, is remember that at this time, we take it for granted, of course today we have our cars, we have our planes, we have our trains and this kind of thing. At this time, the most important water, or I'm sorry, the most important highways of the time were waterways, of course. So that situation of having um, this height of land here dividing the Atlantic from the St. Lawrence, these also were talking about dividing the highways into two countries, that is the waterways of that. Now, of course, you had I mean, horse-drawn carriages and, and post roads and that kind of thing, of course. But as far as real economic value, it was mostly waterways until the um, railways would be built. And of course, there were no railways built uh, up in this area until much later, until after this period, basically. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Good. So thank you so much. So again, there's that map right there is that map right here. And again, uh, the reason why I stopped to talk about the King of the Netherlands is because, again, it's written right there on the map of the disputed territory that was in that uh, magazine. Okay, so we're moving closer to 1842, folks. Moving closer, 1840. We're up to 1840 at this point. And then we have part of the US Lower Canada and New Brunswick. Again, just for the, the sake of uh, clarification, Lower Canada, of course, is Quebec. Lower Canada is Quebec. Upper Canada would be Ontario. Today's Ontario. Okay, so just to make sure we have that clear. So this is uh, by Jemima Mason. Jemima happens to be uh, a gentleman's name in this case. Uh, Jemima Mason and the Westminster Review. And so again, here you can see these lines. Now this line is a bit different. So um, this is just toward the headwaters and then up to the uh, up to the rest of this river basically. So just to kind of show some contrast. But in smaller print you can see he does indicate the line claimed by Great Britain and then the line claimed by the United States. And again, disputed territory written across the map in our area here. So again, the interesting thing with this map is there's also the line proposed boundary by the King of the Netherlands, written on this map too. So that would play into the final, um, the final drawing of the Webster Ashburton Treaty. So just let me give a little bit of information too while I'm at it about Webster and Ashburton as well. Now, Webster and Ashburton did know each other. Webster, Daniel Webster, uh, senator from Massachusetts, and Lord Ashburton, the British representative. They actually knew each other. And um, they did indeed have uh, personally a, a certain uh, uh, amity or a certain uh, friend, a friendly or relationship between each of them. So they both wanted to get the, um, the border right for both parties, but the, um, the dispute itself, even though it was a dispute at a national level, which almost caused a war in a couple of situations, a bloodless rustic war, as we know, uh, or as we perhaps have heard, 1837, uh, so, 1837 to 1838. But what is interesting here is that 
the two people who were negotiating this actually knew each other and respected each other greatly. So that actually may have assisted in some way uh, the conclusion of the Webster Ashburton Treaty in a favorable uh, uh, in a in a favorable way by 1842, basically. Um, so sometimes the personalities involved do uh, do override sometimes the, uh, the the level of dispute between uh, national powers here. So again, this map, the one, the, the two things I point out are the whole, uh, the, the, the writing of disputed territory here, and again, the fact that it says disputed or, or proposed boundary by the king of the Netherlands right here. Okay, so again, this is 1840. And now, here's the British side. Those are mostly American maps I just showed you. Now let me show you a British map from this same time period, 1839, from, um, uh, Featherston Hall, James Featherston Hall, who was a British surveyor. He's part of the British uh, uh, British uh, commissioners at that time. So let's look at the difference in the way that this map is is uh, conceived. So interesting, and I and I, and I chuckle because it's so fascinating historically to see these differences here. Featherston Hall, much. Where's the American line? There is no American line to be found on this map. The British line right there. So again, there's no consideration even of the US line. And there is also no writing about, and up here you have Madawaska Settlement written right there as well, right on the map. And you also have nothing about a proposed boundary by the King of the Netherlands. None of that at all. You see the British line basically from Mars Hill. In this case, it's not even following waterways. It's a straight line. Westward, and then again, Lower Canada right there. So again, it's about perspective. And are all of these maps? Do all of these maps have some um, have some inkling toward the truth and toward what actually is on the ground? Absolutely. But we just have to piece it all together because humans made these maps. So we often look at maps as being almost infallible instruments sometimes. But again, humans make them. So we have to literally. Excuse the pun. We have to read between the lines sometimes. We literally do. So, and <laughs> forgive me for those folks who are, who are not punsters amongst us, but, but yes, we do have to literally read between the lines sometimes here. So, and there is no line to read in between really at all. I mean, we do have a map, or we do kind of have a line here, but there's nothing written on it. There's nothing written on it. But this, this line right here is much bolder. It is much, it's much more of a straight line. This one is kind of wavy. This one is a straight line and it's dark. So again, these things matter. And again, as historians, that's our job to try and unpack it as much as we can with respect to our own biases as people, you know, as historians. When none of us are going to get it absolutely right either. But we can get closer to it, hopefully, by looking at all, all of these different sources and pulling them apart. And finally, um, I've just got a couple more and then um, I'm going to uh, jump a little bit toward uh, toward the beginning, but 18, uh, toward uh, the present, I should say. But here's another one. So 1800. Now this one would be, this one would be used in some textbooks and in some educational, um, in yes, in educational settings. This is by the John Tallis Company. So 1840, two years before. And notice that even though the Webster Ashburton Treaty has not been concluded yet, notice the state of Maine that is on this. And this is an American map. This is of, of US origin. It's pretty darn close to the line you're going to see. It's pretty darn close. So, because you notice how it kind of flattens out up here. Uh, it's kind of along the St. John River, maybe a little bit north. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. But it's not, it doesn't have that triangular form like it does on the other main maps, basically. So this is close to what will be the final border. And this is a, um, and of course, this is a type of map. And you can see, I mean, I know we've got um, several educators in the room here. Um, I mean, I, I know I, I, I teach here, and there are other folks here in this room who have, who have, who have taught. You can tell this is kind of a map that is aimed toward uh, kids, just with the with the with the uh, pictures of Franklin and Washington, and the and the about beautiful artwork to draw kids' attention and this kind of thing. So again, this is one map that would have been used to teach uh, many school children at this time in 1840, and also it would appear in magazines too. But the point I just want to draw your attention to as well, not only the pedagogical value, 
but also to the fact that this line right here is close to what would eventually be considered the border in 1842. So it's, it's actually the closest of the bunch here. And so this, 1840, this is the map that would be officially, um, that would be officially, uh, that would be as close to the one that would be officially used to finally draw that border. And I'll show you the, the final map that was uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'll show you that one after. But this is the one uh, that reduced from the official map A. So this has both, and this is used by the U.S. largely, but also by Great Britain, too, to try and get at what would eventually be the border. And you can see in different colors this one. And I actually did have a chance to look at this one. Um, I've looked at all of these, in fact, at the uh, Ocean Map Library. And again, this is really that last map that would be used by the surveyors to kind of get at the border. And again, we do have the two um, competing sides, the US side here, and then the British side, as to what the uh, border would be. So I know where. And this one is um, the Army Corps of Engineers map. This is the definitive map drawn after the conclusion of West Ashford, 1843. We've gotten past the date here. And this one, let's put it up for you so you can see. Now, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to make it out, but here's the border right there. It's not drawn uh, particularly, um, particularly in, a, in a, like a bold fashion, but here it is right there. That is the new border, as would be concluded and accepted by both Washington and London, basically. One thing I would point out to you, though, folks, is you see New Brunswick is written here, and here Canada is written. Does anybody know why? And I'll, I'll share if, if no one knows. Okay, so Canada as we know it did not become a country until 1867. However, in 1841, they had something called the Act of Union between what would eventually be Ontario, Upper Canada, here, and Lower Canada, which would be Quebec. So New Brunswick was its own colony. It was its own, co it was its own colony until 1867, until it became part of the four province original Canadian Confederation in 1867. Hence, this is written Canada because this is called United Canada at this point. Quebec and Ontario were united into Canada East and Canada West. This would be Canada East, Ontario would be Canada West. Um, and there's a big story behind that, oh my goodness, and it does have to do with the French language. I would go into it, but it doesn't really have to do um, entirely with Webster Ashburton, but I'll be happy to talk about it. I'll just say a very famous name, Lord Durham. And for those of, so anyone that knows Canadian history a little bit, Lord Durham is a problematic figure in Canadian history. It's very complex. Yeah. So, but I won't go into it any further because that will kind of get us away from uh, the border piece here. But there was a French uh, cultural piece involved with the reason why Quebec and Ontario were put together in 1841 uh, in the Act of Union. But anyway, that's why this right here says Canada, and that's why this here, this in this area here, says New Brunswick, because New Brunswick was its own colony at that time. So, and this map was by Albert Gallatin, who was pretty well known as a map maker. Um, and you also had, again, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which of course still uh, uh, does, uh, does a great deal of work today. Uh, in the modern United States as well. And then you have this inset, actually, it's kind of interesting, Rises Point, New York, along Lake Champlain as well. There's just kind of a, um, there's kind of an inset of that. So along the 45th parallel down here, and then that would be, yeah, Rises Point would be about right here, actually. Montreal is there just to give you uh, some geographical um, centering here. Montreal is here, Quebec City's there. We are, uh, yep, Fort Kent's actually on the map right there. It's kind of a blur, but Fort, it says Fort Kent right there. Course. And yeah, so we're actually on the map right there. So, and then he runs away, obviously. Um, <coughs> and Fredericton would be about uh, right there. You know, like, 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 like. So, we're going to kind of conclude. There's, I still have more to do, but I want to just kind of center us here and kind of come back to the map that we started with. Again, just to uh, resettle where we are. So this, of course, would be the final border, as we know. And um, I want to go forward, though, and show you. 
this map, I promised before we finished that I would show you a map that would recenter our perception. And I know up here, most of us know that we are not the end of the world. We know that. <laughs> However, this map, speaking of maps and perspective, I think shows it pretty well. And it's, I've had to, I mean, I, it's hard to find a map like this. Um, and again, as you can see, 1956, so it's, it's literally a road map, obviously. It's, the, uh, it's uh, in the 50s, with obviously cars, and just like they are today, are very important to us. But notice how Maine is very much centered in this map, Maine and the Maritime Provinces. It doesn't say that Quebec is in there. I wish it did, but look at this. It's amazing. But so again, I just really cherish this perspective that we have here, right? So you can see, Northern Maine is in the center of the action on this map. You don't see that every day. You don't see that every day. I mean, we would like to see it more often, I think. So, and I say that also because of the cultural piece. Of course, Quebec is the only jurisdiction in this part of North America that has a French-speaking majority, right? We know that. New Brunswick's about 30 to 35% French-speaking. Depends on the figures you use. Of course, for us, because we're right in the part, we're right next to the part of New Brunswick, right next to the part of New Brunswick that is the most um, concentrated French-speaking area of the province consistently, Madawaska County, New Brunswick, uh, between 85 and 95% French-speaking, depends on how you define that whether it's language used at home versus uh, language that is uh, the mother tongue, the langue maternelle or the uh, langue d'origine, right? Uh, language of origin. So again, northernmost New Brunswick, a lot of this is French speaking. There are areas southeastern New Brunswick that are majority French. There are, there are places that are majority English as well. But again, this is all we can argue again. This is all part of French speaking North America. And of course, we are as well up here from obviously uh, uh, north of Caribou up into the valley, right? So basically, Hamlin Sear Plantation north and westward um, on the main side. And then that, of course, very French deep. So again, when we look at this, look at it that way, this area is right in the middle of the action when it comes to the French language in North America. It is not on the edge, it's right in the middle. Very important. And again, I know that um, most folks, of course, in this area tend to um, self identify as Acadia. That is clear here. You also have the Quebec right on this side. So again, this area is almost right in the middle between a lot of Acadia and Quebec. And like I said, I know that most folks up here tend to identify as Acadia. So, um, so no matter how one self identifies, uh, as far as that, if we if we go into a more uh, microscopic lens, this is all French speaking territory. And again, has been for 225 years, and it's right in the middle. And again, it is just impressive to me when we have a chance to look at a map like this because it literally recenters us. It recenters our vision. And it shows us how incredibly key and central this area is to uh, the, the part of French speaking North America of which, uh, in which we live. So, another, and I'll leave us on this, and we're, yeah, we're um, great, great for time. So. The last thing I want to leave us on is most of us probably remember, and there will be questions too, um, the Congrès Mondial Acadien, the Demi Cadence, right? The World Acadian Congress of 2014. And I just used this map, and many of you remember it from 2014. It centers us again, yet again, right? So, how the Congrès Mondial Acadien basically had us in three different jurisdictions, two different countries, two provinces, one state. And this, it is so rare to see St. John Valley in a map at the center of the action. We've got it again in 2014. Um, and then we saw it in that map from 1956 as well. So a lot of this, folks, is about perspective. A lot of history and a lot of culture, linguistic history, it's about perspective. So, and then there's the bibliography. So um, I can send this around to folks. If anybody would like to share their email with me, I'll be happy to send around this. It's a selective bibliography, and there are a lot of works on this. But I'll be happy as well to take any questions on the border. So, yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, can, you, can you uh, give information about the, the, how the border was uh, officially uh, settled with 
the Native American guys, the, the uh, geologists, the surveyors, and why it left the river near Granite Falls on land. The, the river was part of the border. Right, okay. Supposedly the border. Okay, now we, okay, so let me see if I can, let me see if I can pull up, I'm gonna pull up a map because I'd like to, okay, let's just use this map right here. Um, I'll use the one from 56 actually, I think that might be there. Yeah, there we go. It's a little bit, it's zoned out a little bit, or it's zoomed out a little bit, but I think this sh should show. Okay, so let me go back first to uh, 1783. 1783, we need to find the St. Croix River. St. Croix River, once they find the source of it, Monument Brook, then they draw the north line, the north line into the middle of the St. John River. Which, and of course, that would be, that north line in the middle of the St. John River, that would be to the north and west of Grand Falls. So that's why. So in other words, this border, this would, which constitutes what's called the north line, that would be drawn from the, uh, what they consider to be the head of the St. Croix River up to the middle of the St. John River, basically. So that's why, in this case, Grand Falls happens to be on the New Brunswick side, but that's just because of this geographical reality of from, from Monument Brook straight up the north line into the middle of the St. John. So that's why. It's as simple as that. Well, I guess uh, there's, there's a story that seems to be circling that, that they were given the authority to mark the border. Mm -hmm. They sat on water with the, the guys, and the Native Americans were there to, to show them the, the, the waterways, and apparently, some evening they had some uh, liquid alcohol and, and apparently the water changed following. Is this a, a common phenomenon, a true story? I've been spreading the rumor for 20 years. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you did that. And, and I will say this. If I don't have the answer, I'll say I don't know. I don't know. I'll simply leave really? it there. I don't know. But what I can tell you, though, is that the 1783 border with Monument Brook, I'm not going to try to talk around it if I'm not sure. So the 1783 um, uh, border that was given with uh, here with uh, Monument Brook and eventually up that north line to the middle of the St. John, that is why basically Grand Falls ended up being on the New Brunswick side because of that, that due north line from Monument Brook up to the middle of the St. John River. So. But yes, there was certainly drinking involved. There was drinking involved with it um, as far as we know. With the um, uh, with 1842 as well, this was some of the surveyors, and that's part of the reason why you had Fort Blunder, which was uh, ended, which ended up on the wrong side of the border. It was a fort that ended up on the wrong side of the border, and that had to do with people in Bombay. There's, there's some truth to it. So there's some truth to folks drinking and drawing lines that are a little bit crooked. And I, I don't have, a, I don't have those folks. I, unfortunately, I don't have it here. Let me see if I can. Uh, I don't think I. It's hard to see it on this picture, but if you were to really zoom in on the 45th parallel, which is right here, which is basically the border between Vermont and northernmost New York until you get into the St. Lawrence River and Quebec, you'll notice that it zigs and zags. Oh. There's a, there's a suspicion that, that, uh, that uh, some alcohol may have had a little something to do with it. Yes. So most likely it did. So. So, so, there's, so you're not you're not incorrect at that, but I just don't know specifically with regard to what you mean with the um, the Grand Falls line and everything. With, with that, okay. answer. that I'm not so sure about. But like I said, I can tell you exactly how the border was drawn now, as far as looking for the source of the St. Croix River on the front. So oh, Grand Falls could have been part of the American side. Uh, if they had chosen a different source for the St. John River. Yeah. I mean, I'm not St. John, I'm sorry, for the St. Croix River, St. Croix. You didn't get St. Croix. If they had chosen a different source for it, if it had been a little further east, at that point, it could have put Grand Falls in the US. It could have. <laughs> it could have. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Did, did I answer your question at least as well as I was able to? Cool. Go ahead. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I, I continue. Uh, absolutely. Well, do you have more questions? I'd be happy to hear. <laughs> More questions, folks? Yeah. I mean, if you have another one, yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I know people talk about uh, Maine used to be northern northern Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. What happened to New Hampshire? New Hampshire, okay. Where, well, where did you, I mean, New Hampshire seems to be sort of in a way of that. I don't understand how that all came about. Okay, so basically, 
Um, New Hampshire would, was at one point part of, early on in the in 1600s, part of the colony of Massachusetts, but they decided to uh, go their own way. And of course, uh, they, in New Hampshire, requested some sea frontage. And as we know, it's about 18 miles worth from Port, Portsmouth down to uh, the uh, Merrimack River, basically. So from the uh, from Piscataqua River, of course, down to the Merrimack River. So, so that's that's how that basically happened. New, New Hampshire requested some some uh, ocean frontage. So that's why. Yeah. More questions? Yes. How yes. did Maine derive its name? What's that? How did Maine derive its name? Well, Maine actually is from the the French Le Maine, which of course is a province in France. Interestingly enough, Le Maine. Le Maine. Yeah, it's pronounced Le Maine, but it's pronounced uh, but it's written Maine. Le Maine. The name is a province actually in France. So, um, oh, it's a province in France. In province oh, okay. in France, yeah, Le Maine. Uh -huh. But even in French as we know, including in Quebec um, uh, or elsewhere in Acadia, people call it Le Maine. It's pronounced the English way. Even in Quebec, they pronounce it Le Maine. But in France, it's, it would be Le Maine as far as that province is concerned. So, okay. there's a province in France called uh, Le Maine. So, does that make Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. More questions? I feel wheels turning. Yes, so I would love to hear. Two little ones. What's with the notch on the left hand side, uh, on the west side of the tip of Maine? What was that about, with that notch? Right? This right here? Yeah. Okay, so uh, basically, it's the St. Francis River right there. Okay. And yeah, that's the St. Francis River that goes into the St. John. Mm -hmm. So, because the St. John, as we can see, it, it flows continues in the state of Maine, but it, um, basically where St. Francis is, that's where it splits, yeah. where the international border splits and goes up to St. Francis, up to La Pointe de Gamuk, Pointe, Pointe, I don't even know how you say that in English, Pointe, 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 so, and there's something interesting, and most of you here probably know better than I do, there's something interesting about the border with La Pointe, Pointe de Gamuk, Pointe, Pointe, um, and the international border. When they decided to, uh, with the railways, they actually, instead of having that border right at the mouth of, or right at the outflow of La Poine de Mont, they moved it in about 50 yards in order to allow for the British to have a rail line and also a road. Because if you go to Poine de Mont in Quebec and you cross that bridge, there's a bridge right at the outflow mm -hmm. on Route uh, 289. Route 289. And Technically, technically, uh, that should be, that road should almost be in the state of Maine, really, you think about it, because if you look at the treaty the way it's written, it says that uh, the border uh, will end at the outflow of La Pouine But they give about 50 yards or so to allow for a road and to also to allow for a railway. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can go to that park where you can walk across where um, the, the, there's, a, there's a state of Maine flag and a Quebec flag on both sides. It's right on the border where you can walk across. And it's in that 50 yard right of way, basically, that was allowed um, by both Washington and London so they could have a railway to go through there. That they being a British North America could have a railway to go through. Is that? OK, yes. Larry. Were there any trade agreements in the treaty? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Were there any trade agreements in the treaty? Trade agreements, OK. so. In Webster Ash Britain, there were not really trade agreements as such. It was more to determine the border. Um, and there's another piece of the puzzle, though, like I said, in Webster Ash Britain, and that was slavery. So that was in Article 8. So there were a few different pieces, but it was mostly. Actually, I'll pull it up for you. Hold on. Got it right here. Webster Ash Britain Treaty. So the only. Yeah, so there, there it is right here. The only true um, trade agreement as such, and it had to do actually with um, with um, shutting down this Article 8, like I said, shutting down the international slave trade, the illicit international slave trade at this point, because keep in mind that the United States basically, um, and most of the world, had outlawed international trading of enslaved peoples in 1809. That does not mean that slavery didn't exist, of course, in the US until 1865, but this is the trade of enslaved peoples from Africa into the US, the international slave trade. But as we know, like from the Amistad, right, the movie that was done on it and many other situations as well, um, there was even, um, I don't know how many of you 
know um, Henry Louis Gates, the uh, historian that does Finding Your Roots on PBS, he had talked about someone whose roots, and I, I won't be able to tell you chapter and verse here, but someone's roots whose ancestors went back to a slave ship that came into a ship with enslaved people that came into Mobile Harbor, if I'm not mistaken, in 1860, of with illicit uh, uh, with an illicit cargo of enslaved people. But that was illegal as of 1808-1809 because of uh, the uh, the ending of the international slave trade. So what article, all of that is to say that Article 8 right here, that's the closest we can really come to it, and that is to crack down on the illicit slave trade. It creates a mechanism for London and Washington to actually work together to crack down on uh, uh, the illicit slave trade. I'll just read maybe the, let's see, I'll read the, uh, the first part of this, and I quote, it's kind of hard to see. The parties, I'll read it from the monitor. This is Article 8 right here. I'll, highlighted so you can see it. Okay, so the particles, the parties, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. The parties, the parties mutually stipulate that each shall prepare, equip, and maintain in service on the coast of Africa a sufficient and adequate squadron or naval force of vessels of suitable numbers and descriptions to carry in all not less than 80 guns to enforce separately and respectively the laws, rights, and obligations of each of the two countries for the suppression of the slave trade. The said squadrons, uh, said, uh, the said squadrons to be independent from each other, but the two governments stipulating, nevertheless, to give such orders to the officers commanding their respective forces as shall enable them most effectually to act in concert and cooperation, and it goes on to the end of it. But the key, of course, again here, is the suppression of the slave trade. So again, it's that international piece. So that's about as close to as we can get to any kind of trade piece, but again, it's already illegal. It's just a matter of setting up some kind of uh, apparatus to, to crack down it together. That is Washington and one. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Thank you. I have yes. one call. We Going back to the slave states that you went, you talked about right at the beginning, yep. who decided that those 12 states were not going to be slave states and the 12 states that were? State legislatures. They decided whether whether slavery would be legal in their states or not at that point. It was pretty much by state. Because as we know, there's not even the word uh, slavery written in the US Constitution. They kind of went around it yeah. because they had to, again, and again, I'm, I'm being very careful not to judge. I'm just trying to understand the mentality of folks here uh, that, that wrote the documents. That's So we should keep that in mind. Just, that's, that's where my perspective as a professional historian comes in here is they were trying to keep sectional balance um, to, um, to appease southern slave owners, basically, uh, those who uh, owned enslaved people. So it was basically a state, it was by state whether, uh, whether slavery would be allowed or not at that point. But were those states that they say are not allowed, are not slave states, mm -hmm. were there uh, people there that wanted to have slaves? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, and just like there were people like the Grim Case sisters who were from South Carolina who were from a slave owning family, but they had to leave the South because they were abolitionists at the risk of their own life. So yes, and just like in any human community, okay. I'm sure there, you know, there were some, especially, um, and I'll tell you, I'll give you an example, and that would be in New Jersey. There were still slaves on the books, and again, I'm, I'm not saying this other than just as a point of fact, there were still slaves on the books in the 1860 census in New Jersey, but here's the big but. Basically, in New Jersey, it was, a, it was a grandfathering system. So if you were happened to be still an enslaved person, then um, it was up to your um, the person who owned you to, um, to, to free you. And there were still a number of slaves on the books in New Jersey in the 1860 census, actually, even though New Jersey at that point, for all intents and purposes, was a free state. So. Wasn't that the cotton belt where uh, landowners needed the, the labor to pick the cotton and it was way cheaper and that's how the whole thing started? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, and the cotton belt would largely be from southernmost North Carolina, this area, west, westward into Louisiana and eventually Texas. Texas wouldn't become a state until 1845. But, yeah, Texas as well, of course, yeah. Um, and these days, I mean, I, I was just actually in South Carolina. 
I even saw a couple of cotton fields in southeastern Virginia, which surprised me because it is a little chilly to grow cotton in, in, in Virginia. But I did actually see a couple of cotton fields. Most of the tape, I, I did I just say that, just coming today. Mostly peanuts, mostly peanuts in Virginia. Um, but also to a lesser extent, tobacco as well. So I didn't mean to say potatoes, because I'm in the potato country, we're in the middle of harvest, right? So, so yes, peanuts, there we go. And they actually feed their hogs peanuts in a lot of southeastern Virginia. It gives better flavor to ham. So, so more questions? Yes. Coming back to uh, that particular book, exploration. About 15 years ago, we used to go there and leave our snowmobile at custom mm -hmm. and walk over. And we had people get our guests from New York and Rhode Island. And uh, we went to the restaurant restaurant and mm -hmm. the people there uh, did not want uh, uh, Linda had to they didn't want to speak uh, English oh, so yeah. Linda had to translate tra uh, order their lunch for them mm -hmm. so and the thing is we just walked across yep and and I have to say though also it's important that you know we did in Quebec um, there are a lot of folks who don't speak English, who literally don't. It, it's not necessary to be able to live in most of Quebec. So, so I'm not sure of the exact situation, but um, I'll just say that when I studied in Quebec City in the late 80s, only about a quarter of the folks that I knew could speak English, but I, I was there to improve my French. But still, there are a lot of folks who don't because it's not, it's the only officially French, uh, French province in Canada as far as the official government language is concerned. Since 1974 in Quebec, that's so it may be that they literally didn't know. I don't. I don't know. I, I think that's what really it was yeah. for them to un, not understand. They want. The, I mean, they're taking orders for a meal. They want to make sure that they got the right order. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, what, yeah, I yeah. think that was more that than anything else. Mm -hmm. That's it. So there we are. Yes. Uh, back to King William, mm -hmm. which you know. His border was a lot closer to. Did he stay with the St. St. John River on his border, or did he go up the St. The St. Francis River? Um, for the most part, King uh, William would have gone up the St. Francis, but the area that was different, and I don't have a good map to illustrate this, but let me see. Uh, let me see. Okay, this isn't a great one, but um, you can kind of see here that this western part of what's the disputed territory eventually. This was closer to King William's border along the westernmost uh, main border. And I don't have the chapter and verse on that, but it was a little bit, there's a little bit of a discrepancy with, with what King William uh, had set up for the border versus what would end up being the case. But if you look at King William's border, it did, in fact, and as a matter of fact, you can see it right here. Um, so here's the St. John uh, right here, and then eventually St. John splits off, of course, as we go westward and then St. Francis. If you look, uh, oh, it's hard to see, but I'll just read it for you. It says disputed boundary, or, or um, proposed boundary, I'm sorry, by the King of the Netherlands. And that word proposed is actually one like the St. Francis. <coughs> so, yeah. Where is the St. Croix on there? St. Croix would be down here. Let's see. There's the north line. So the St. Croix River would be right along here, basically. Thank you. So Callus would be about right there. St. Stephen New Brunswick, Callus Main right there. And then Monument Brook is about right there. And that's where they draw the north line up to where Grand Falls is, basically. Right around Grand Falls. So how come, yeah. the, how come the King of the Netherlands had a say in the first place? They, both London and Washington, wanted a neutral third opinion. Oh, okay. So yeah, why. you said that. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. What made you decide to stay here after you've gotten your PhD and whatever, all that, all this important stuff that you've learned? Okay, so, and, and, I'm, and I'm still learning, uh, oh my goodness, I've learned so much here today with all of you folks with your questions, it's amazing, there's stuff that I'm going to be looking up. That's so, and oh, that's, that's wonderful, and I tell my students all the time, if they stop me or if I don't know, good on you, it means you're curious, so I appreciate that. Yeah. So having uh, said that, though, the answer to the question is, I'll, I'll start and I'll kind of give the Cliff's Notes version. So uh, at the age of 13, 
13, 14, 14 actually, instead of 1984, it's 169. So, um, 83, I went to Montreal. Didn't speak a word of French. My mom and some of her, are we still recording down there? <laughs> oh, okay. okay um, <laughs> my mom and some of her friends, you know, from college, basically said, hey, we're going to Montreal, we're going to bring kids along, you know, bring our kids and everything. So, I went. And, and my grandmother actually went as well. So my grandmother and I uh, were, my mom's went along with my mom and her friends from, from college. And I just, she told me I'm a mood, I did Quebec, you know, she told me I'm a mood. And not everybody in the room I think speaks French here, so I'll say, yeah. I want to speak, I want to learn French. So I did that. And that became, I mean, that's what I did for my undergrad at St. Lawrence in Northern New York. Fast forward to 2001, I come to Maine to do my PhD, and just when I'm about to finish in 2008, I just, it's one of those things where you just, it's just blind luck or faith or whatever, whatever our personal value system, systems happen to be with that. So I basically open up, for me it happens to be faith, and I open up the Bangor Daily and I see this, uh, this ad, it says MSED 30 for French teaching. I'm thinking, hmm. Teaching French, and I thought, thought about once I finished my PhD that I would go back to doing what I did before, which was teaching French and Spanish down in Maryland. Not necessarily in Maryland, but going back to teaching high school or middle school. So I applied for the position at MHID 33. I was fortunate enough to have gotten it, and got it here the next year, and said I wanted to stay in the Valley. I wanted to anyway. So I got into new MFK the next year, and I've been here ever since. And like I said, I still live in Senegal, and that is by design. I love it. Yeah, oh, it's very, 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 very nice place. Very, yeah. Folks, that's the first town. Folks here at the college have been wonderful. It's just that the folks in Senegal were the first folks to welcome me to the valley. That's the reason why. It's not, it's not an either or, it's an and, and basically. So that's the reason why I've chosen this thing. So very good. Folks here have been very good to me. That's people who have been here as well the college. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you.